Okay, we're up to chapter 5 on this. And chapter 5 will be the last chapter that I will be going really deep into the chapters and pick, nitpicking at every picking at every Jehovah Witness doctrine that stands out different than what the Bible actually says. And when I mean the Bible, I mean every Bible other than the New World's Translation. Because this is getting kind of old for me. Uh, I really don't want to start off my knowledge of the Bible with figuring out what the Watchtower does differently. I mean, studying their stuff first and then trying to find out what it really says afterwards. I think I'm doing myself a disservice to where if I read a correct Bible, a properly translated Bible from the get-go, and I read that or listen to it, you know, uh, through, through a podcast or whatever, or uh, audio book of the Bible, uh, when something, if I, you know, pick a page here and start reading through it, uh, it will stand out. And, and that's how I was able to kind of find out all these discrepancies that this booklet is telling you and what the Bible is actually reading, really saying. Because all the discrepancy starts to pop out at you once you tr read this after you read a real Bible or properly correct translation of a, a Bible. I don't want to start off with the Jehovah Witness material and learning what their dogma is first before reading a real Bible because then, you know, you'll, you'll be lost. Uh, personally, I will be lost and, and it'll be really frustrating. So it's best just to start off in the right foot with the real Bible and, uh, and then go through this if you're going my route of activism to try to save your family or, or friends or something like that. So let's get to it. Like I said, we're in chapter 5, the last chapter that we're going to go really deep into their dogma. As far as this book here, what can the Bible teach us? The first init initial indoctrination book that they give out to the general public to brainwash them into following their rules and regulations or tradition of men. Chapter 5, the first page out of that, uh, page number 52, the ransom, God's greatest gift. Basically, Jesus' uh, death and resurrection, and the meaning behind that. So here, some time ago, I put in a little note here saying, uh, first of all, they say, by, spending, by sending Jesus to the earth as a ransom, Jehovah has proved that he really loved us. And this is, you know, referring to Jesus' death or execution. Then I write down in the, in the bottom there, uh, just a, a simple question that I have, but wait, didn't Jesus choose to die for us? I don't know. I really didn't look that up to see. So, but there's other applications here, but the first couple of pages are uneventful until we get to page number 55. So right down here, paragraph 13, page 55, chapter 5. How was the ransom paid? Jesus gave his father the value of his life in the 33 years on Nisan 14 of the Jewish calendar. If you are invited to what they call a memorial, that is like something huge that they harp on all the time. Nisan 14 is not in the Bible, I don't believe. I don't think it is. They don't specify what night that he died or what day that he died or anything like that. Only that it was near the time of the Passover, and it was right before uh, the Sabbath. That's as close as, that I can remember as a novice as, you know, what the actual date it was. And I guess they traced it back to it being nice and 14 of the Jewish calendar. That's something really big that they harp on instead of the, the message behind why he died and, and came back three days later in redemption of all the sinners. Uh, they, to me, they always try to sort of feed you all this little minutia and trivia of the events uh, and, and not really emphasizing on the, the purpose of, of all these, you know, events that took place. 
that, that was just an observation that I sort of uh, think of when, when I read their dogma and, and all their talking points, if you will. So in, re in my response that uh, Jehovah allowed Jesus' enemies to kill him, that, that's the one passage that, that they are uh, referring to, and they're referring to Hebrews 10.10. 10. If I remember right, I don't think Hebrews 10.10 10 really doesn't emphasize anything about Jehovah or God allowing Jesus' enemies to kill him. But what I do have is, uh, it's, it's very vague and possibly out of context. That's what I have in my notes here. Uh, uh, speaking of Hebrews 10.10, 10, you can look it up to see what they, it, it actually says uh, in your Bibles. But uh, I counter that with John 10.18. And Jesus says about this particular subject, uh, about people taking his life or, or something to that effect, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So that is in rebuttal to their claiming that Jehovah allowed Jesus' enemies to kill him. But uh, Jesus is fully capable of doing it himself. Then the next sentence here in the booklet here in orange. Three days after that, Jehovah brought Jesus back to life, not as a human, but as a spirit person. There, there's one of those Jehovah Witness buzzwords, spirit person, like a ghost or some entity, created entity. I don't really know what they are referring to as spirit person. It's kind of like grace. Uh, grace is in the Bible all over the place, but the Jehovah Witness Bible replaces that word with undeserved kindness so they're they're to me they're demeaning the word or making it more complicated by giving you the, de the definition of the word in the sentence instead of the word itself which is grace as an example so in orange here spirit person is not in the bible i don't think spirit person is another one of those jehovah witness buzzwords that they throw around quite often to sort of distract you from the main point. Uh, first of all, three days after that, Jehovah brought Jesus back to life. Uh, I believe there are verses there that says that Jesus brought himself up and also the Holy Ghost. John chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. And I'm just going to give a, a, a segment of that verse there. Uh, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again. Then again, they're um, omitting the whole story of that particular uh, topic there of Jesus being raised three days later, or being resurrected three days later. The rest of that sentence that they're saying from this book here is uh, not as a human, but as a spirit person. So there, that spirit person is a, one of the, an, another one of those Jehovah Witness buzzwords to distract you from the main topic of Jesus Christ there. Now they're calling him a spirit person instead of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. So to dispute that, uh, they're trying to say that there was another body made to where Jesus was implanted into so he could travel the earth, you know, after his resurrection. That's what they call the resurrection from the memory of God which he placed into a, a whole new body on earth to represent Jesus Christ and it, it's confusing to me. It's, it's good science fiction I would say but uh, it's not what the Bible talks about I don't think. If anything they make a point to sort of dispute any reference of, of you know, the myth of what the Jehovah Witnesses are trying to say. Like It's like, and like I said, I'm agnostic. Uh, I don't truly believe in, I don't believe fully in, in all the Bible stories and things like that. But if you really think about it, you know, critically, it's like the writers, the, the inspired writers of the Bible knew that this particular scenario will come up in 2019 this year or earlier in the Jehovah Witness history there and they placed this specific passage 
Uh, Luke chapter 24 verse 39 and it says behold my hands my feet that is it behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have so there Jesus is telling doubting Thomas Thomas one of his disciple that look it's me it's flesh and bones uh, handle me I'm not a spirit. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. I mean, it's like the Bible writers knew that this particular scenario was going to happen where, where this part of the story was going to get altered by some other entity like the Jehovah Witnesses and here they're placing that particular passage there to refute that particular discrepancy. The Jehovah's Witnesses still run with their explanation of you know, Jesus being resurrected three days later. Another verse to dispute the Jehovah Witness claim on that regard is 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 through 3 and it reads, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Emphasizing, come in the flesh. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is already in the world at this time. Pretty prophetic uh, explanation of what I think about the Jehovah Witnesses and their dogma. So keep in mind that the, the dogma of the Jehovah Witnesses is that Jesus was resurrected as a spirit person, not the original body that he died in three days ago. So with that I bring you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 12 through 16 and it says but if it, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised our preaching is worthless and so is your faith in that case, we are also exposed as false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead, but He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So that there is saying that if you don't believe that he was raised, Jesus Christ from the dead, then your faith is, is futile and you are still in your sins. The Jehovah Witnesses are still in their uh, sins. Yet again with this dogma, they're going door to door preaching this other gospel. So in this page here, page number 57, is not necessarily what they have written it is what they draw drawn so here you see Jesus here strung up on a torture stake which is another deflection of you know the main point of the story of his death by you know having you concentrate and argue about whether did he die on a cross or a tree or, or torture stake that minutia is really not important. I mean, the bottom line of that story is is that he was executed, died, and was raised again three days later. But as as I don't know if you can make it out here, but here you have just one nail going through both Jesus's wrist on the pole there, and in the Bible, John twenty, chapter twenty, verse number twenty five. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see 
his hands and marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side I will never believe this is Downey Thomas uh, given some requirements of what will make him believe that Jesus has returned from the dead and he pretty much wants to see the nails plural multiple nails marks on Jesus's hands that particular verse is actually stated correctly with the plural uh, word there of nails in the New World Translation. is It actually says nails in it, so they didn't catch that one. We'll see if the next uh, edition that they'll come out with, if ever, will uh, be changed or not. Yeah, as you can see from my poster here on these pages, uh, the more and more you get into the chapters or deeper into the, the booklet here, uh, the more discrepancies you will find. And that's why I could only make it up to cha chapter 5. Uh, this first point here, page number 58. Now that you have learned about God's great love, how can you become his friend? Again with the uh, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood's approach of uh, what can the Bible teach us uh, explanation. It is not easy to love someone you don't know. John 17 verse 3 says that we can come to know Jehovah. And they have in bold lettering here, come to know Jehovah. Which in, in a lot of videos out there it, that I've seen on YouTube, it, it seems to imply that to come to know Jehovah is, is basically an academic sort of relationship. In John 17, Chapter 17, verse 3, John's chapter 17, verse 3 actually says, Now this is the eternal life, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, I'm on BibleHub.com right now, and that particular verse, that they know you, New Living Translation, to know you, the only true God, English Standard Version, that they know you, Berean, that they may know you, New American Standard Bible, that they may know you, King James, that they might know thee, the only true God, and so forth. None of them says, come to know you. None of them says that at all. I think I said maybe one. I can't find it, but uh, it's different. So with that, it's not come to know you. It, it changes, to me, it changes the meaning to where, so it changes the meaning a little bit that they may know you is more of a personal relationship with God and Jesus. And they come to know you is more of an academic relationship, uh, meaning you just have knowledge of him, which is really big in the Jehovah Witness dogma. Uh, they try to steer you away from having a personal relationship with God and Jesus, uh, only going through the Watchtower organization for that particular uh, personal relation. But they'll cram down the academic relationship down. Now this is a huge one here, and, it, and it's the I think the the focal point of all the suffering that, that goes on within the Jehovah Witness and uh, It says here in their booklet accept Jesus ransom sacrifice the Bible says that The one who exercises faith in the Son has everlasting life John 3 uh, verse 36 John 3 Verse 36 in the NIV says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Not anyone who exercises faith in the Son has everlasting life. So believe and exercising is just two different verbs. I mean, okay, let's use this as an analogy. I'm going to exercise breathing so I can live. Meaning, I have to perform the function of breathing so I may live rather than 
I want to breathe so I may live. I mean, they're, they're complicating that particular verse uh, with the replacement of belief with exercising faith. So going down BibleHub.com again with all the other versions, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, Any, and anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life, English Standard Version, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, basically almost the King James, and I love their, you know, language, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I love the King James for just for that. Okay, so far we've seen the word belief for in, in replacement for exercising faith. Now the contemporary English version says everyone who has faith in the Son didn't say exercising faith. Believe, believe, believe. Aramaic Bible in plain English. Whoever is trusting in the Son. It's kind of weird. But the lion's share of... Uh, uh, it looks like 20 plus Bible versions out there says belief in the Son instead of exercising faith. Again, that's a Jehovah Witness sort of stereotype there is changing simple words into complicated description of the words. So the next point in the book here says we cannot simply say that we believe in Jesus. To accept the ransom we must do something about our faith. At James chapter 2 verse 26 we read, faith without works is dead. And that's like their number one sort of argument where most of the New Testament there is saying that you have to have faith and with faith alone you are saved from Armageddon or, or you know whatever. And they always fall back to faith without works is dead so they could make you, you know, work for your salvation for the Watchtower and Track Society or the Jehovah Witness. And there are multiple, Paul pretty much, anything written by Paul or, or preached by Paul is, is a proponent to work-based salvation where he pretty much says that you just have to have faith in Jesus Christ that he was raised in, you know, in three days. So here I have Titus in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 it says he saved us not because of righteous things we have done meaning works but because of his mercy he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit Jesus gave us mercy and saved us from whatever and verse number 6 of that same chapter this is the spirit he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that's one. The next one. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. That's pretty compelling uh, testimony from Paul there about work-based based, uh, salvation. And if that's not enough, we'll continue with some more. Again, Romans chapter 3, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And if we read this in context with the other chapters, it, it follows through with that main message right there of uh, salvation by faith. Uh, again, if you want more sort of uh, dispute against faith without works is dead, uh, pretty much all of Romans chapter 4. That whole chapter is another sort of explanation why work based faith is, is not really salvation. Then we go again into Romans chapter 11 verse 5. In the same way at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if it is by grace then it is no longer by works. Otherwise grace would no longer be grace. Then finally Galatians chapter 2 chapter 21. 
I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could not be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I kind of like the King James version of that particular verse. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So if grace is come by the law instead of righteousness, then the whole meaning of Christ's death is pointless. So that sums up uh, chapter 5 and here in the summary sections where more propaganda is being spewed. Uh, I got a couple of, couple of things here. So here on page number 59, they try to hit home now a yearly event that they hold all the time, and I think I mentioned it, and it's the memorial of Christ's death. It's, it's like the Super Bowl of the Jehovah Witness, or in Europe, I guess it would be the World Cup. It's, it's almost in that particular, you know, status. So here they're saying when you attend the memorial, you will show that you remember the ransom and the great love that Jehovah and Jesus have for us. And uh, I think here, and they also want you to go to end note number 16, which is in the in the back here. And I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna go there. And they they give a brief explanation that you are not to partake in in the eating of the bread and wine which is the Lord's evening meal in communion with uh, Jesus Christ. And he did say to his disciples that to, to do just that in remembrance of him. Here again, they want you to do this memorial once a year, and the Bible really doesn't specify to do it once a year. It only says to do it in remembrance to Jesus Christ, which if you're really pious, you can remember him every day. So you could just, you know, take bread every day in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Or maybe once every five years. Who knows? But according to the, to the Jehovah Witnesses, once a year during Passover, uh, sometime in April, is when they want you to go through their ceremony or their tradition of men. Because that's, that's what exactly... It is. It's, it's a tradition of the Jehovah Witnesses on, you know, people that are not going to heaven, according to their dogma, are not to commemorate Jesus' death by partaking in, in the eating of uh, the Lord's evening meal. And to me, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware lest any man spoils you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after the rudiments of the world and not of the Christ. That's the only thing I have to say about the the, uh, the memorial uh, tradition of men every year by the Jehovah Witnesses. Then again at the very end here at the summary of chapter 5 there. So here in page 61 in the summary section of chapter 5 how can we show we are grateful for God's gift of the ransom and they give you some verses here in Luke 22 chapter 19 and under their sort of little remark here attend the memorial of Christ's death each year and I write not attend but do the evening meal and Luke 22 verse 19 in, in the NIV version and he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me. So again, the Jehovah Witness just wants the ones that are not the anointed 144,000 people going to heaven, everyone else in the world are not to partake where the Bible itself, Luke 22, verse 19, specifically says uh, to do just that in remembrance of him, to partake in you know, the Lord's evening meal. Not just attend, but to participate. And they will argue that, and this is the, an argument that I've seen on YouTube about, uh, no, that was only for the, the 12 disciples who are anointed uh, that are to partake. And he was just referring to the 12 apostles there in the Last Supper, where traditional Christianity would, would 
want to say that it was for everyone, not just the 12 disciples. Kind of like heaven, heaven was for everyone, not just a certain few. And that is the end of chapter 5, and I have a headache. I'm going to take a couple of Advils, and I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I will, though, cover some big points from the rest of the chapters here, from chapter 6 through the end here. Just the big ticket items. I'm not going to go into details and in all the pages and stuff. I mean, things are going to stand out to you, but the ones that I'm going to cover in the next video would be major... Oh yeah, I almost forgot this one last point. In Jehovah Witness publications, if you are brave enough to dare to go into them, uh, this is one thing you should take a look at. Anywhere, when, when they quote somebody or quote from the Bible or other people outside sources and they end the sentence with a dot, 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 like here, double check those references uh, with two or three outside sources at least. For example, here, chapter 5, at the end of the summary, this is what they love to do. And they, they're taking John chapter 3, verse 16, and it says, God gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith, again with saying exercising faith instead of believing or having faith in him, might have everlasting life. No other Bible out there or other translation has the word might. Might is not there. God gave his only begotten son so that everyone believing in him will have everlasting life. It's a big difference between will have everlasting life than might having everlasting life. Just saying.